The following message is from King's Church 1066, based in Hastings, Bexhill and the surrounding area. For more information, head to our website, kings1066.org. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you for a lovely welcome. Always fantastic to be in Hastings, where the sun always shines. Thank you. And uh, it's just great to be here. This has been home church for us. I worked out for 43 years. Uh, I walked through the door of a... I think it was a scout hut or something like that. Uh, some community centre, Judy, you'll remember, some sort of scout hall, scout hut. And uh, I was 16 years old, so you can work it out, uh, 43 years ago. And just see what God has done, not just here, but obviously carrying the work on in Bexhill and also in St. Leonard's. This is really a wonderful thing that God has done. I remember getting the first call from Gary Dyer. I don't know if Gary's in the house at all, but Gary wasn't with us. Uh, he was in another church, but I remember getting the call from Gary Dyer saying, there's a building for sale up on the ridge. Do you think you guys would be interested? Uh, I think, yes, we would really be interested, hence boundaries, hence Hastings Centre. So it's just wonderful to be at home, to be a sense of family, and uh, I'll say, we've, Anne and I just feel at home here. We know so many of you so well, and it's such a privilege uh, for me to come and bring God's word to you. Now, let me just say before I start, this is not what I thought I was going to be speaking on. Uh, I was explaining to actually Veronica uh, Clark earlier. Uh, it's kind of encouraging and slightly annoying when God does this to you. Uh, I've got another word prepared, and, and it's actually it's a word that I had felt for you from before, but I, I, I didn't get a chance to bring it that time either. Maybe it's just a wrong word. Maybe I should just get rid of that one. And, um, but that one, that one will come one day, hopefully, if I ever get invited back. But I felt God speak to me, actually, as I was out walking early in the morning, that this church is to become a well of the Holy Spirit. I feel as a church, you've really been known, and we've been known here, as a church that ministers grace and mercy and justice to our town, haven't we? It's wonderful to see the Hope, is it the Hope Centre, is that what we call it? The Hope, King's Hope, Hope at King's, just to see the sign of that, and hope, there's hope. And to see, you know, We've watched you on Newsnight, and we've watched you on Songs of Praise. I'm not quite sure which is, uh, you know, which tips the balance in uh, impressiveness. But your reputation, what you, God is doing through you here in terms of reaching the community, in terms of serving the disadvantaged, releasing people, ministering to people, blessing people, encouraging people, I think it's wonderful and you need to be applauded for what God's doing through you. I remember Dave Lyons, I don't know whether Dave Lyons is here, I don't expect any of these people here, they, they knew I was speaking so they're probably not here. So I remember, I remember social services when I was here in the 1980s, social services said to Dave Lyons, and they said this like privately, so he said, never say it publicly. So, but that was the 1980s, I'm sure we can say it publicly. They said, look, social services just wouldn't, wouldn't survive if it wasn't for King's Church Hastings because of all the fostering, all the care, all the support, all the pastoral work that was being done. You've got a great reputation in this town and this building has been used mightily. But I felt God say, that which you've done in terms of feeding and clothing and looking after, God wants you to do spiritually now. That there's a well of the Holy Spirit that's being opened up in this place and that God wants to see multiple salvations. God wants to see multiple healings. God wants to see multiple works of his spirit. You see, over the last two years, I don't know what it's been like for you, but over the last two years, I would say two things have happened during this pandemic in the churches that we've been serving. We've noticed two distinct things that are negative things. There's lots of positive things as well, but two distinct things which are negative things. One is this. We've lost our community impact because we've lost our community. So we lost being together, didn't we? We spent two years or quite a long time in various ways, looking at computer screens and being very individualistic. I tell you, the thing that didn't suffer was the Word of God. It's great to see the Word of God being preached in different settings. Some of us learnt to preach a bit shorter. <laughs> Can I hear a hallelujah? Um, thank you, Rose. Um, <laughs> And that was okay, you know, it's okay watching the video, watching the screen, that was okay. But what I felt suffered 
was our worship together and our communal experience of the Spirit together. Because if you look in the Bible, although you can experience the Spirit on your own, you're not designed to experience the Spirit on your own. You're designed to experience the Spirit in community. You're designed to experience the Spirit as part of a body, as part of a functioning temple. In fact, the Bible uses that analogy. It said there used to be a physical temple of bricks and mortar, there used to be a physical temple where sacrifices happened. There used to be a physical temple. But now, actually, that's been abolished. It, that's gone now. And we are the new temple of God. We are living stones built together as a temple. That's what Peter says and Paul says. It's like this holy temple built on the foundation, just like Rose was praying, built on the foundation of Jesus Christ as the foundation stone. It rises as each one is built together and it's filled with the glory of God. That wasn't really happening on our television screens, did you notice? Now, it may have been in Hastings and Bexhill and St. Leonard's, but it didn't seem to be happening an awful lot with us. When we came back together, there was that sense of community, that sense of who we are together, the people of God being filled with the Spirit. And I think we've lost something of praying for one another, because are you allowed to touch people anymore? You know, can I allowed to put a hand on their show? You, we've kind of lost something of that, I think. I think we've lost something. And I'm, I'm primarily talking about our churches, not you. But we've lost something about the gifts of the Spirit being given by the Spirit and prophecy and healing and words of knowledge and tongues and interpretation and words that set people free from bondages and strongholds. We kind of dialed down on some of that stuff. And I think God wants to bring that back to us. He wants us to be filled again as a living temple by his spirit, a community of the spirit. This church started as a community of the spirit. See, lots of things have come out of it. Apostolic mission, going to the nations, wonderful social action projects have come out of this. Church planting has come out of this. Leaders have been sent all over the world because of what God's done. But we didn't start as a sending apostolic base. We didn't start as a social action base. We didn't start as a church planting base. We just were hungry for the Spirit. We were just hungry for God to move among us in a new and fresh way, for us to be individually filled, corporately filled. And then this is my second point. So this is only the introduction, by the way. <laughs> I haven't even looked at the notes, as Mark Alexander pointed out to me earlier. The second thing is this, when you get a community full of the Spirit, something happens, you start to be outward looking. And you see, that's what happened in Hastings in those early days. We were a community full of the Spirit, and then suddenly we got outward looking. We started planting churches, we started sending leaders, we started doing works amongst the poor and the needy. Why? Because God did something among us. He filled us with his Spirit, and then he sent us on the mission of Jesus. You see, Jesus never anticipated his mission being fulfilled without us being filled with his spirit. He told the early disciples, wait for the spirit, Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 1 verse 8, wait for the spirit and when the spirit comes on you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's the sense of being a sent people again, which I think we've lost during the pandemic. We've lost that sense. We, we became quite inward looking. What are the rules? How do we keep them? What's two meters? What's a, what's a face mask? And how do we do this? And how, how do we do things safe? And they're all good things, guys. They're not bad things. But we became very inward looking. We became very aware of one another and one another's health and one another's concerns. And that's not a bad thing. But it's just what has happened in the last two years. But I feel this. God wants to fill us with the Spirit as a community, turn us inside out in order that we might go again to the world, that we might again be a sent people, and again we might be a people who flood the nations with his glory. That's what I feel God's saying. Now, I don't know about you, that was the thing that marked Hastings Christian Fellowship as it was in its early days, or King's Church as it became later. The thing that marked us out as different and of course, other churches were experiencing this. Dennis was experiencing it, a Battle Baptist church. Other churches were experiencing it. But what marked us out as different was that we were a people who received the Spirit. We were a people of the Spirit. We didn't just have correct doctrine, but we stepped into it and we received something of an empowering of the Spirit that sent us out to do exploits for God. 
And that's what we need to rediscover. So my challenge to you today is this. Have you individually been filled with the Holy Spirit? And are we corporately being filled with the Spirit? See, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus where undoubtedly they've all been filled with the Spirit. And he says, go on, be being filled with the Spirit. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. And the danger, I think, with some charismatics or Pentecostals is we look back to a date. We look back to a camp. We look back to an event. We look back to a setting. Oh, I was filled with the Spirit in 1983. I was filled with the Spirit in 2001. I was filled with the Spirit in 2011. I was filled with the Spirit in 95. But are you filled now? It's important that you are, you go on, be being filled with the Spirit. And you probably know that in the Bible there's huge controversy. Well, it's not in the Bible. Christians have made it controversial. It's not controversial in the Bible. But Christians have made it controversial. When do you get the Spirit? When do you receive the Holy Spirit? Some people say you get it all at conversion. And they refer to Acts chapter 10, Cornelius' household, when Peter the Apostle doesn't really want to go first because they're dirty Gentiles. And God says, no, they're clean. I've made them clean. Go and speak to them. And he said, while I was still preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on them. Why shouldn't I baptize them? The Spirit came on them. The Spirit filled them with power. He came on them. So it's almost like it was spontaneous. But then you get other illustrations. Obviously, the disciples, there was quite a time lag between the time they knew that Jesus was alive, they knew that Jesus was Lord, they knew that Jesus was King. There's quite a time lag between that and then them receiving the Spirit. There was a time lag in Samaria, in Acts chapter, I think it's Acts chapter 8, when the Samaritans received Christ, they saw miracles, stuff was happening but they hadn't yet received the Spirit. The apostles came down, they laid hands on them, they received the Spirit. And then, of course, you get Paul himself. When does Paul get saved? Of course, everyone knows, on the road to Damascus. Three days later, a rather brave disciple called Ananias gets to go and pray for Paul, and he says he was filled with the Spirit. So there's... It's sometimes spontaneous. And do you know what? I think the answer is yes. Do you get it now? Do you get it at conversion? Or do you get it later? And the answer is yes. You get it. <laughs> you get it. And I don't really think it matters as long as we've got it. And the question is, have you got it? Are you drenched in the spirit? I think, I think it was Lloyd-Jones. You're not allowed to preach without mentioning the doctor. And... Uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, my parents were uh, members of his church in London uh, in the 1950s to 60s, and he said this, receiving the Spirit, it's a little bit like, he said, you can go out in London, and he said, suddenly there'll be a cloud burst, and you will get drenched right through to your underwear, you know, you'll, you'll get drenched. And sometimes that's how some of us have received the Spirit, there's been this, this downpour, this drenching, we just get it, we just get wet. Other times, he said, you can walk through London on a foggy night, those pea supers that they used to have because of the fog and the smog. You can walk through London on a foggy night, and he said, you can start off dry, but half an hour later, you can arrive soaked right through to your undergarments. <laughs> soaked. So the issue is not when did you receive it. The issue is are you soaked? Are you filled? Are you filled with the Spirit? And if you're not, or you were previously, you see Spurgeon says we're designed to leak. We're designed that it comes out of us. We're not designed to be closed containers of the Spirit. We're designed to be dispensers of the Spirit. Therefore, it, he comes out of us. So therefore, keep being topped up, keep being filled. That's why Paul writes to the Ephesians, go on, be being filled. So let's, for the moment, put those theological issues aside. Is it a conversion? Is it later? It's now. We need to be receiving the Spirit. And this community was birthed in the Spirit, and this community needs to carry on receiving the Spirit. Now, if you've got a Bible, I wonder if you could turn, turn to a very famous chapter on receiving the Spirit. It's by Jesus himself, and it's in John chapter 7. You kind of know this story. You know this illustration. You know this 
episode in Jesus' life. You've probably heard dozens of stories. You've probably heard dozens of sermons on this. But this is Jesus himself and the Apostle John deliberately picking this event, a real-life event that happened in Jesus' life. John picks this as an example to show us about the Spirit. So it's John chapter 7, and we're going to read verses... Let's read verses 37 down to 39. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, this is what John comments, By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up till that point, the Spirit hadn't been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Obviously, Jesus now has been glorified. And biblically, the glorification of Jesus is the cross, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, all that glorious event. He's been glorified now. And when he ascended on high, he poured out his Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. So we don't have to wait anymore. This is available for us. So let's just have a look at this passage and then let's pray that God would do something wonderful amongst us. And I believe he wants us to be a people and to be a community of the Spirit. And he wants to open up some wells that I think have been blocked up by COVID, blocked up by Just, I think, convention sometimes. Just blocked up by just, well, that's the way we do it. We do it, that's the way we do it, and that's the way we do it now. And it's like, we only have this time, and we only have, and we have the kids, and we have that. No, unblock some wells. God wants to unblock something. And I believe we're going to pray, and God's going to answer our prayer. So first of all, what what is going on here? What's, What's happening? Well, it's a feast. It's a feast of tabernacles. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, they did something amazing. Anyone want to go to New Day? Right. So, right. In New Day, I guess you camped under canvas or in a tent for, I don't know, five days, six days. How many days? Five days, right? It felt like six days, right? Five or six days. Uh, That's what they did on the Feast of Tabernacles. They would not go to... Uh, Norwich, obviously, but they would go out onto their roofs, and unlike us, we have pointy roofs, because we have a lot of rain, and we need to dispel the rain. They have flat roofs on their houses, and for about six or seven days, they would all camp outside in their own house, on their own roof, made with palm branches, and they'd make these booths or tents. So sometimes it was called the Festival of the Tabernacle, which means the tent. Sometimes it was called the Festival of the Booths, which just means tent again. And they would, for seven days, camp outside. And they were reminding themselves, as you remember when you go to New Day, thank God I don't live in a tent. <laughs> now, some of the kids may go, oh, that was quite okay. But some of the adults were going, it really wasn't okay. And I'm really pleased to be back. Thank God we don't live in a tent. Thank God we live in a... And they reminded themselves that we used to be a nomadic people. We used to be a people that wandered around the desert. We had no hope. Even Abraham, our father, was called out of Ere of the Chaldeans into a land that he didn't really know where he was going. We were a nomadic people originally. And God, through his sovereignty and mercy, has given us the land. He's given us Israel. He's given us a place of our habitation that he's going to dwell with us. And they thank God for that. They said, thank you, Lord. We camp out to remind ourselves you've given us a home. It's nothing like being not in a home to remind yourself you've got a home. Second thing they did during that time, during that uh, tabernacles week, they reminded themselves that God was the provider of water. Now, actually, isn't it interesting right now, (laughs) the climate and the country that we're living in, 
we kind of need to be reminded of something like this as well, that actually it's sovereign. Heaven, rain comes from heaven. It's the sovereign blessing and provision of God. We don't automatically have a right to turn on the tap and water comes out. It's the grace of God. It's the mercy of God. It's the sovereignty of God who gives everyday things to us. And for them, didn't have southern water or whatever you have, they had to ask God for water, had to pray. And they remembered, it was in their collective memory, that when they were in the desert, there were times when they were so parched, when they were so thirsty, they had nothing, they had no water. And Moses, God said to Moses, speak to the rock, as you do, you know, <laughs> rock, could you please provide some water? And water came out, he said, like a spring, fresh water, and gave them sustenance. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, they reminded themselves that God was their provider of water. But for them, water was more than a symbol of life. It was a symbol of new life. For them, they would also remember some of their prophetic promises as a people, they'd remember promises that were spoken to their prophets, like Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 47, when Ezekiel sees a vision of the temple. You imagine this kind of space here, which I like, by the way, Paul. You've done some great work over the last few years with this building. And uh, yeah, this, you imagine this is the temple and these are the temple steps. They would, they would, it said, there was, a, there was a water course, Ezekiel said. He could see coming out of the temple and it flowed down the steps and it flowed into the streets. And he said, first of all, it was like ankle deep. Then it was knee deep. Then it was thigh deep. Then it was waters to swim. Do you remember that? It was waters to swim in. And then it said, if you look at the geography of it, it goes to the Dead Sea and even brings life there. It, said it, was, it was teeming with fish. Fish in the Bible is always a symbol of new life. Jesus said, I'll call you fishers of men rather than just fishers of fish. And when fish and teeming things like that, it's always a symbol of new life, new birth, blessing, fruitfulness. And they remembered that God was the one who promised that from Israel a spring would come, a river would come that would bring life not just to them but to the nations. And that's what they would be remembering during this whole week of the festival. Now, what they would do is every day, they would enact a kind of ceremony. The ceremonies are okay. They kind of remind us of things. And what they would do is, I don't know, what do we got over here? They, they, would, they, would get, they would get a golden pitcher or a plastic jug to contextualize it. They would get a golden pitcher. The high priest would march down the temple steps. And by the way, there were a million people watching. Every day they gather for this event. They packed into Jerusalem. Some accounts say up to a million people packed into Jerusalem at the time of the tabernacles. He'd march down the temple steps. He'd go to the pool of Siloam, which we know a little bit about. He'd draw water. He'd sing a series of psalms, the great halal psalms, one of them, with joy, I draw water from the well of salvation. And he'd march right up to the top again. And don't worry, guys, on the electrics, I'm not going to do this. He would literally, to almost to enact Ezekiel's prophetic vision, as a prophetic act, he would literally pour the water down the temple steps again, hoping that it would become a mighty river. And it's a, light, a little bit pathetic. It's like, it's supposed to be a river to swim in. You've got a plastic jug full of water. But it's a prophetic act. And he would slosh it down the temple steps. And everyone would cheer. Wonderful. Come back tomorrow, we'll do it all again. They did this for six days. Now, on the seventh day, some people called it the greatest day of the feast. He would do this again. He would grab his... Ikea plastic water jug. He'd go down the steps. He'd, with joy, I draw water from the well of salvation. He'd come up to the top and he would pause. 
On that day, he wouldn't pour it out. Because it was only a prophetic act, and there's only a jug of water, you can't swim in it. And he just waited, and waited. And it was one of those, you know those kind of prophetic moments? You know those silence moments? You know those holy moments? When not even a baby is allowed to cry? I'll, I'll give you another holy moment that you might be familiar with. Does anyone here know of any legal impediment why this man and this woman shouldn't be joined in holy matrimony? <laughs> you don't even cough. If you've got a baby, you... <laughs> it was one of those holy moments. Now, the Bible doesn't actually say it, I must be honest, because that is rabbinic tradition, what I've just given you, based on what's been passed down through the ages. The Bible doesn't actually say the context exactly of what's just happened. But I kind of think, John chapter 7, on the last and greatest day of the feast, right? we know that it's on that day. We know that it's on that day that he doesn't pour the jug of water out. I kind of think it was at that moment, that's just me, living the Bible, reading the Bible, experiencing the Bible, sensing. I kind of think, probably, it's then. On the last and greatest day of the feast, in brackets, when everyone's quiet at the holy moment, some northern prophet stands up and says, by heck. Because <laughs> he had a northern, you know, it was, he was a northern, I'm sorry to say this, but he was a northerner. You know, the accent wasn't right, it just didn't fit in wasn't trained in the right schools. But he says, if you're thinking about water right now, uh, duh, yeah, whole point of the ceremony about water, if you are thirsty, then come to me and drink, and from within you will flow a river of living water. Can you see how prophetic this is? Can you see how fulfilling this is of Old Testament prophets and prophecy? Jesus is saying this very quickly. If you're thirsty. So are you thirsty? Yes. See, it starts with thirst. It starts with a desire. It starts with a heart's cry. It starts with, God, I don't want to carry on as I am. God, in fact, I don't think I can fulfill the commission that you've given me to go into all the world and preach all the gospel to all the people without the propulsion of the Spirit. I can't do it. I'm thirsty. I need the Spirit if anyone's thirsty, number one. Number two, let him come to me. And this is where I think Christians make a mistake. We seek out, you know, the man of power for the hour. We seek out the woman of anointing. We seek out the prophet. We seek out the apostle. We seek out the leaders. We seek out, the, the, you know, the anointed ones. Now, we're all anointed, and Jesus said, actually, we don't come to any man or any woman. We come to him. So a little bit later, when we're praying, now, because we want to be a people of integrity here, because it's not a free-for-all, God is a God of order, not disorder, and because we love you pastorally, God gives leaders. And there will be some leaders here. There's leaders of 242 groups. There's leaders of connect groups. There's leaders who've been trained as part of previous prayer ministries. There's elders. There's deacons. There's all sorts of leaders here. And actually, yes, unashamedly, I'm going to ask leaders to pray because these are people we know. They're trained and equipped. But do you know what? Even as they pray, you're not getting anything from them. You're getting it from him. Jesus says, come to me and drink. And don't be in the line like this, you know? You're like this, with two eyes shut. In fact, no, two hands out, one eye shut. And it's like, oh no. I think it's Sam McCrasley coming to pray for me. Quick, if I look really spiritual, I expect Natalie will come. <laughs> you know, mercy, help me. Oh no, Sam's coming, you know? No, listen, it doesn't matter who comes, even if Sam comes. <laughs> I'm picking on him because he's secure and he leads the meeting and he's my friend, he knows. It doesn't matter who prays for you. It's not about the human agency. We're just part of the body of Christ. He's the one who gives the spirit. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Do you know what? 
drinking isn't that hard. You know, you don't, unless you've got a very sick baby, you don't have to teach it to drink. And I think Jesus used this. I mean, yes, you might have to teach it to eat certain things, but drinking comes naturally. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me, come to Jesus, and drink. Receive. Now, you've got to do something to receive. It's an act of faith. Just the same way you came to Jesus, there was a day when you came to Christ and you said, Jesus, I believe you died on a cross for me. All those beautiful prayers earlier about the blood of Christ. You died for me on a cross. I receive your forgiveness. You, you, you acted in faith. Luther says we receive everything from God with hands of faith. And you take it. But this is, this is what Christians do with the Spirit. Not only do they do the, you know, oh no, it's Sam. They do this. O oh, holy water of God, wouldst thou flow from this thine own dear vessel into my anointed lips, amen, cross. Yeah. I'm not getting anything. No, no, take it, receive it. Drink it, take it, receive. When somebody prays for you, when they put their hands on you, take that as a mark to receive. Now, this is not particularly biblical, I don't think it's unbiblical, but I like to kind of like breathe in the Spirit. One of the, the things about the Spirit, he's the breath of God, the Ruach of God, who breathed life into the early uh, humanity, Adam and Eve, and he breathed life into the early church, the wind of the Spirit came, and there's always something about breath and the Spirit. And I just love to, when people pray for me, I just love to go, <sighs> I receive. It's just an act of faith for me, it's just like pouring the jug of water out. It's not biblical, it's not unbiblical. But just receive. Whatever you do in your heart, receive. You take it. It's not for them to give it. It's for you to receive it. You take hold of it and you say, in Jesus' name, I receive the Spirit. I take hold of the Spirit. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And it says, then it's going to flow from you. A miracle happens when you receive the Spirit just like when you receive Christ, a miracle of new birth happened in your life. Something was born. You were born again. When you receive the Spirit, a miracle happens. Not only do you receive the Spirit, you actually become a container of the Spirit. You actually receive the Spirit. And Jesus said, from your and kind of different translations say different things. One of them says belly. One of them says innermost being. The Greek word is koleos, which means the innermost, innermost, innermost parts. Right. So like in your gut. I mean, where do you hear bad news? <laughs> in your gut. It's like right in there. Where do you rejoice? Right in there. Where do you have a gut feeling? Right in there. It's like right in there. And it's the Greek word koleos, which actually was temple speak, it was rabbinical speak for the temple. It means the center of the center of the center. They thought Israel was the center of the world. It's not geographically, but it is spiritually. They thought that Jerusalem was the center of Israel. It's not geographically, but it is spiritually. They thought the temple was the center of Jerusalem. It's not geographically, but it is spiritually. So they had this phrase, the center of the center of the center. We might say the bullseye, the target, right in there. And they, Jesus said, right there, right in your temple, you will receive the Spirit and a, a fountain, a well, will be opened up so that actually it, he might flow out from you. So the whole point of this, and we're okay, electrics, is that you get filled and filled and filled and it comes out of you. And the whole point of it is that when you go through the week, when you bump into people in the shops, when you bump into people in the, in the petrol station, when you bump into people, actually, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, no, actually, it comes out of you. I'm doing it to Sam because he's hot. <laughs> I won't do it to you, don't worry. The whole point of this, the whole point of receiving the Spirit is not we become a happy, clappy church, although that's great. The whole point of it is that we become a dispensing church of the Spirit. We become, we become the river of God in Hastings, in Bexhill, in Celeste. We become that in life. And that's what I think the enemy has tried to stop during COVID. I'm not saying COVID is demonic. I'm saying the enemy has used it to stop some stuff in our churches. And actually, we need to unblock it 
and we need to see the river of God flowing again. And it starts with every single one of you being freshly filled. So we're going to bring this meeting to a close for two reasons. One, I don't believe in long preaching. And secondly, I have to go to Bex Hill to do it all over again. Hallelujah. But when I leave the building, God doesn't. Hallelujah. God's here. He's going to be with you. And I wonder if we could just stand and the band could come up. Mark, uh, sorry, Neil, I think I looked at my notes once. <laughs> Neil said, the thing about you, Jeremy, is you never look at your notes. I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a safety blanket for me, having notes. It's all there. <clears throat> the whole point of a preach like this is you could be deceived right now by thinking you've got it. By agreeing with me, by laughing with me, by having a good time, you can be deceived into thinking, yeah, oh yeah, we're a spirit-filled community, but are we? Are you? Jesus said you're blessed if you do these things, not just if you hear these things. And you're blessed if you receive the Spirit, not just talk about it. So all these guys come up. We're just going to sing together. I don't know which song they're going to sing. But as we sing together... If you, because the church is made up of individual people. The temple was made up of stones. We are living stones. We're individual people. And the Spirit just doesn't come and fill a, a fake void. He comes and fills individual stones and bricks. He comes and fills individual people. So if while we're singing this song, you go, I'm thirsty. If anyone's thirsty, let them come to me, Jesus, and drink. Why don't you just start to come out to the spaces? Find a space. Don't stay in your aisle. Don't stay in your seat. Find a space. And those who are Connect leaders, 242 leaders, those who've been trained in previous prayer, ministry settings, those who are leaders in this church, it's just for your safety. Not because they're better. They've just been trained. That's all. Just been trained. They're going to pray for you. And as they do, you are going to receive the Holy Spirit. So let's just worship. And as we do... Let's not make do this. Let's not take time over this. Let's do it. Let's receive the Spirit. Lord, I pray, even as we bring this meeting to a close, I pray that we'd be a congregation, a people full of the Spirit, and that Hastings would reverberate with the Spirit. It's, it's almost quarter past 11 now. What are we, where are you going to be at quarter past 11 tomorrow? That's where God wants you to be, a dispenser of the Spirit. Just I knock, as I knocked into Sam and we laughed about the water coming out of my jug to Sam, that's where God wants you to have a word for someone, a prayer for somebody, a kind word for somebody, an act of kindness or mercy or love or grace. He wants you to be a dispenser of the Spirit. So I pray, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us afresh. Fill us with the life of Christ that we might do the works of Christ in our day. In Jesus' name.